I, uh, I, I'm excited to bring the word to you today. We're continuing in our series, A Mighty Move of God. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. I want to talk this morning about the presence of God. The presence of God. As we talk about a, a move of God in, in our lives, a move of God in our church, you know, we're not just talking about an event. You know, we, I, re, I remember as a kid, we used to have revival services all the time. And, and uh, I've even had some people recently say, when are we, we going to have revival? And I'm going, okay, I, I, this is, we're waiting on God. But, you know, in their mind is bringing a speaker and have services. And that's kind of what people's idea of this. But we're talking about just a move of God and experiencing his presence in such a real and uh, genuine way, you know, how he wants to move. And it's just us being postured to be ready to receive whatever it is that he uh, wants to do in us. Because I know that he wants to use us for things way beyond ourselves as individuals and as a church. But um, I, I want to just ask this question. How many of you have ever felt, you felt or sensed the presence of God? Sometime in your life, okay? Um, Maybe that happened today in, 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 since you've been here during worship or whatever that might be. Barry, I want to say, great to see you. Barry's been through quite a bit. He had a stroke a few weeks ago, and uh, he up and going here. It's great to see you this morning. Um, how do you know that you've experienced the presence of God? So most of you raised your hand, and... Uh, how, how did you know? What was it, what was it that, that you said, oh, I know that that was just it? Was it, did you get um, chills? Maybe up and down your spine? Anybody ever experienced that before? Maybe you had a moment where you just broke out in goosebumps and it was just like, ooh, have moments like that. Or maybe, maybe you just had this overwhelming uh, desire. I mean, you don't know, but you just start crying. Some people, some people weep in the presence of God, and it, it affects different people different ways and different times, different things, and uh, you know, not to say that every time you feel a chill or every time you, you cry, it's the presence of God, because you know, a, a, a young man can sit next to his girlfriend and get chills, right? <laughs> uh, you could be cutting an onion in the kitchen and, and have tears. And I'm just going to go out on a limb and say, I don't think that's necessarily the presence of God. Um, but, but those things do happen, and I'm not minimizing that. But the reality is, uh, the presence of God isn't just a feeling. There are feelings that go with that. Sometimes we just kind of sense, you know, an overwhelming, whatever, whatever that is. Uh, maybe it's just a calmness. Like in the midst of a storm in your life, there's just this calmness, and you go... I just know that's the presence of God because where I was fearful and worried, I just, God's given me peace. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can do that, but I can tell you this, that the presence of God changes everything. I want to read just this passage of scripture in Acts chapter 17. It says this, he is, he is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord over heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. Our God is so good. From, from one man, he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when, uh, when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. He's not far. And his desire is that the nations seek after him. Is that happening in our day? But I promise you that if you seek the Lord, you will find him when you seek him with all your heart. That's a promise of the word. And so we want his presence more than anything. We, we desire that. We look... Uh, forward to that. I, I go back to the song that we sang earlier. It just, it just says, make room. I love that song because it's like a prayer. It's like a confession. God, I'm making room for you. How many of you, when you sing that song, it's like, I, I, I mean that. 
I'm making room. So God, you do whatever you want. How many would love for God just to do whatever he wants to do? Not everybody is so bold. But this is the reality. We got to come to that place to say, God, if I want your will and your purpose and your plan to be done in my life, then I've got to give that to you and say, God, whatever you want, because your way is better. We believe and know that God's way is better. So as we talk about the presence of God, we're talking about practicing the presence of God, I, I want you to imagine a weary Israelite who's been wandering for 40 years on a journey through the wilderness. And in the darkness of night, he lifts up the flap of his tent, looks out uh, of his tent, and looks up and sees a pillar of fire in the sky. And he turns to his wife and says, everything's okay, honey. God hasn't left us. You go back to the Old Testament, God was with the children of Israel as they were wandering in the wilderness, a, a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. It was leading them and showing them and guiding the way. Everything's okay because that pillar was signifying God's presence with them. I remember uh, years ago as a parent of young, young children and any of you who have parents have some stories like this, but you know, the, the, the times when it's bedtime and something's got them spooked, they're a little bit scared of something or, or whatever, there's just some anxious and they can't sleep. And I remember many times of going into my kids' rooms uh, at night when they couldn't sleep or just having a struggle and laying down on the floor beside their bed. And it's like just the presence of mom or dad in the room seems to make everything better. And a lot of times it might be laying there, it might be holding a hand or, or whatever it is. But, and so I remember laying there, um, you know, with my, with my, in the half dark with my eyes kind of open but kind of closed so that they couldn't see that they were open. I'm, I'm watching them the whole time because um, I'm probably going to fall asleep if I'm not. I, I've done that a few times. Um, but, but watching just to see, are they, are they asleep? Can I make my quiet exit out? You know, only to find I start to make a move and one eye opens. <laughs> but nothing, nothing exciting happens because it's like dad's in the room and the eye just closes and everything's okay. There's just something about the presence. Consider the disciples in the storm-tossed boat when they saw Jesus walking to them on the water and they heard him say, don't be afraid, take courage. I'm here. They were struggling in the boat, and then Jesus came walking on the, wand, on the water. So whether it's wandering in the wilderness or in a, in a boat in the storm on a lake or in a fiery furnace turned up seven times hotter than normal or in a valley of the shadow of death, the reality is God is, God is there, and his presence changes everything. And as his people... As his followers, we should value his presence and desire his presence more than anything. But as we talk about the presence of God, I, I want to first talk about uh, the problem. If there, if there is a problem, here's, here's what I'd say. If you, if you know a little bit about the Bible, if you've been in church for any uh, amount of time, you've probably picked up on the knowledge of this truth that God is always with us. Throughout Scripture, we, we hear time after time God saying to his people, giving them a mission or just giving encouragement to them. And he says th these words, don't worry, don't be afraid, I'm, I'm with you. The word that we give to this is a big word uh, to describe this attribute of God is omnipresent, which means he's present everywhere at the same time. And that might be hard for our minds to just to wrap around. So wherever I go, God's with me. And wherever each of you go, God's with you. And the psalmist said this, wherever I go, I can't escape from your spirit. Psalm 139, I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. There's nowhere that I can go in all of creation where I can ever get away from your presence. He is omnipresent. But the problem is this, if God is present everywhere, why do I sometimes feel like he's nowhere to be found? Have you ever felt that? God, where are you? Even David the psalmist who, who will talk about God being with him, there's many times where he's expressing the same thing. Where are you? Why, why, why have you left me all by myself? 
we need to understand there's a difference between God's omnipresence and God's manifest presence. The om omnipresence means that he's everywhere all at once. Even when we're not aware of him, he's still there. And we need to remember that the Holy Spirit lives in us as believers. And so uh, even if he feels far away, we know that he isn't. There's a song that I remember when I was a kid uh, in my teenage years. I, I, I think it was by, um, uh, oh, I can't even think of who it was by now. Um, but it says this, he's as close as the mention of his name. If you've ever been in a, in a, in a difficult space, in a difficult time in life, and you know, I don't know what to do, but I just call on Jesus, and you know that his presence is right there. I love the, the fact that he is so near. He's always there. But his manifest presence is his presence that is made known where God chooses to reveal himself in some tangible way. And there's a lot of examples in scriptures uh, from Moses in the burning bush and God speaking to him through the bush. There is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the furnace for not bowing to the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And uh, as they were thrown into this furnace, the, the guards that put them in prison all burned up and died. But here they were in the furnace, completely alive, and God in the fire with them. God's manifest presence. The disciples in the storm where Jesus walks on the water. So there's the problem of his presence. We know that he's present everywhere, but we don't always feel or sense it. But here's what we do. We engage our mind in the truth of scripture and we say, God, I know. Even if you're not showing up in this moment, even if I don't see you manifest yourself in some way, there are times in our life where it's just interrupted and we know obviously this is God that's in this moment. I told a story from 13 years ago when I mowed my grass without gas in my lawnmower. And I'm telling you in that moment, as I'm mowing my yard, it's not like God showed up face to face with me, but I had this awesome overwhelming realization there is no gas in my tank when I started and I've almost mowed my whole my whole lawn I broke out in goosebumps while I'm mowing my lawn it's dark I can hardly see to do this but I was afraid to turn off my mower because it had no gas I had no idea I'm like God I don't know what you're saying to me but in this moment my ear is tuned to you I know you've got my attention manifest presence of God. Maybe you've experienced that. And it doesn't have to be that way all the time, but what we go back to always is whether we sense it, whether we feel it, whether it feels like he's far away, we can know that he is there. That's the promise of scripture from the beginning to the end that God is always with us and nothing changes that fact. Genesis chapter 28, another manifest presence of God. Jacob has a dream. And basically, God promises the same thing to him as he did to his grandfather Abraham. In this dream, he saw a ladder to heaven and there were angels going up and down. And God spoke, spoke this to him. He said, I'm giving you this land, Jacob. I'm going to give you numerous descendants and all the families of earth will be blessed by you. God's promise to Jacob after that was, I am with you. I will be with you, I will protect you wherever you go. And Jacob's response was, surely the presence of God is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. There are times when God shows up and we aren't even aware until after the fact when something happens. So much of the time God is present and working and we're not even aware. John Piper said this, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life. He's always doing 10,000 things in your life and you might be aware of three of them. God is always there and he's always working. The great commission we have to go into all the world and take the good news. Jesus gave us this promise. He said, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's a promise. We know that wherever we go, whenever we do, he is with us. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never, I'll never abandon you. He always makes good on his promises. I don't know a promise that God has given me that he's or given us in his word that I've not seen happen. God is good, he's faithful, and we can trust his promise of his presence with us. Don't let, ever let the darkness of night or the presence of a storm cause you to doubt whether God is present or working in your life. Don't ever let the darkness of night or the presence of a storm 
make you think that God is not there and working in your life. Those storms ser- serve only as a, an opportunity for God to show up. How many of you have seen him show up in the storms of your life? It's his presence that proves his presence. This is what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter three as he's calling him. He says, look, I, I, I'm sending you to Pharaoh and you must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? And who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered, I'll be with you. That's all, it, that's all he needed to know. Even that was tough for him, but that's, that was the answer. I will be with you. God spoke to Joshua. He said, don't be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He said to Isaiah, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Don't be discouraged for I'm your God. And he also said, when you go through the waters, when, the, when you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. The psalmist said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you're with me. There's something about the presence of God that just makes everything okay. Our Father is with us, and we don't have to fear or we don't have to worry. In Matthew, the angel told Joseph, you will call his name Emmanuel, Jesus, which means God with us. He's with us. So we have the problem that sometimes it feels like he's so far away, but we've got the promise that never will he ever leave us. He is with us wherever we go. The presence of God is not something that we can turn on or turn off. It's available all the time. God is everywhere. We just have to connect with him and trust that he's there. But then we have the practice of the presence of God. And that's what I want to talk about today is practicing the presence of God in the few minutes that we have left. You see, just knowing the facts about the presence of God is important. But knowing why he is present is more significant. Why is he present? God is present with us to work out his purpose and his plans in and through each of our lives. God is there. He's here. And he's there to help you, to work in you, to accomplish his purpose. Philippians 2.13 says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. He's given you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. What pleases God? That's what we want to do. All the pursuits and and activities that you can come up with to do in your life, and we all have them. Our life can be filled with them. The most important thing is what pleases God. You can accomplish all the things of this world. What does it profit a person, though, if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit their own soul? What is it that pleases God? Hebrews 13, 21 says, may he equip you with all that you need for doing his will. May he produce in you the power, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. He is working in our lives if we will just surrender and submit to him. Make room. God, I make room for you to do whatever you want to do. It's one thing to be encouraged by the promise that God is with us. It's a far greater thing to live and to walk in his presence. To live and walk in his presence by choosing to align ourselves with his purposes. What is God's purpose for my life? Am I pursuing that? Or am I doing my own thing, going my own way and just adding God in here and there? The essence of a Christian life is to live all of our life with the awareness of the presence of God. To to be under his authority and all for his glory. That's what God wants. That's That's what we should want to have God's purpose, his presence in our life. I don't know if any of you have heard of a man named Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence uh, was a man who was born in the early 1600s. And uh, he had quite the life, a life of of poverty. Uh, He ended up going into the military, served in the 30 years war. This was, he was born in France and uh, came back from that. and uh, kind of did some things, had a, had a relationship with God, but kind of wandered a little bit and ended up at a monastery in Paris. And at this monastery, not a, not a monk, but he uh, served for the first 15 years as a cook. And then he got transferred into uh, fixing sandals uh, for, for the people in the monastery. 
But um, Brother Lawrence had quite a story, and really there's a, there's a little booklet. You could probably download it online, or you could go buy this little book. Uh, it's called Practicing the Presence of God. And Brother Lawrence's focus in all of his life was bring God into everything. God should be involved in everything. Everything I do is for his glory. Everything I do, God can be involved in it. So even if he's flipping an omelet in the kitchen, God's, God's doing that with him. Practicing the presence of God. And this is a quote from, from Brother Lawrence. He said, I cannot imagine how religious people can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. For my part, I keep myself retired with him in the depth and center of my soul as much as I can. And while I am so with him, I fear nothing. But the least turning from him is almost unbearable. In Exodus 33, the Israelites had worshipped a golden calf. They made this calf and while Moses was up on the mountain. And Moses was afraid that the Lord was going to abandon them in the wilderness. And in Exodus 33, 15, we see God, uh, Moses pleading with God. And he says this, if you, God, if you don't personally go with us, please don't make us leave this place. He's begging for God's presence. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me or on me and on your people if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. God, it's your presence among us that sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. I want to just tell you today that God's presence in your life will set you apart from all the other people on this earth. That's not to build you up and tell you you're somebody special and go out with your nose up in there. It should cause you to be humbled. The reality is, is there's something about you as a follower, as a believer in Christ, who has given their life to Christ and you're following him. Do you call yourself a Christian? Are you following him? Listen, what you have available to you and what uh, ha has happened at the point that you accepted Christ in your life, the Holy Spirit was deposited in your life and his presence makes everything different. There should be something different about each one of us. Your light. He's called you to be a light. Called you to be the salt of the earth. The only way that you can do that is with his presence in your life and you allowing his presence to live through you, to serve his purposes and his plans and for your life. Moses knew that without the Lord's presence, he and the Israelites would be lost and doomed. They would have no peace, no power, and no purpose in life. So the question that I want to ask you this morning is, how do we as believers demonstrate or practice the presence of God's spirit that lives in us? How do we demonstrate that presence? How do we practice the presence of God in our lives like Brother Lawrence did? How do we show that, that we are the children of God? Listen, it ought to show there is something different about you. If there's nothing different about you, it's time to go back to God. It's time to, to seek after him. But there is something different. And I say, let that light shine. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men so that they may see your, your good deeds and bring glory to your Father. That's a good thing. Not to say, hey, look at me. Look at how spiritual I am. If you do that, guess what? You're going to be humbled. Either you humble yourself or you're going to be humbled. But let the presence of God work in and through your life. So that when, when you're wherever it is, you're at work, you're in your neighborhood, you're in your, in your home with your family, with your extended family, that there's something that people see. They go, what in the world is different about you? I've noticed that you're not like everybody else. The greatest thing that someone could say to any of us as, as followers of Jesus is you're not like everybody else. And it's the presence of God. I want to just quickly go through four things. We're, we're quickly running out of time. Four things that we can practice, how we can practice the presence of God. And the first one is obedience. Obedience. Our obedience to God's commands shows that we recognize his presence within us. Listen, it's one thing to, to obey your parents when they're in the room. 
But how many of you going back to when you were a child and uh, mom and dad weren't around, there's a little bit of tempting to uh, push the limits a little bit. Anybody ever, maybe, maybe nobody's ever done that. But there's something different when mom and dad are there than with, when they're not. It kind of depends what friends you're with, what kind of things you might be willing to do. And I remember growing up and my mom saying this to me, God is always watching. And I had this in the back of my mind all the time. And for some reason, I just believed it. And I'm glad I did because it's true. But the reality is if God's presence in your life, whatever you do, whatever activities you're involved in, do you know that he's doing that with you? You're taking him with you wherever you go. Our obedience to God's command shows that we recognize his presence. Jesus said this, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Jesus said earlier in that chapter, John chapter 14, uh, if you love me, obey my commandments. One of the ways that we worship God and practice his presence is through obedience. What has God been asking you to do? Maybe you've been dragging your heels on. Maybe it's to give something up. Maybe it's to pick something up. I'd say live in obedience. God will help you. That's what his presence is there for, to help you to accomplish his plan and purpose in your life. And if he's telling you to do something, the greatest way that you can practice his presence is listen to him and be obedient. Another thing that we can do is, is worship. Hebrews 9.15 says that Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant between God and his people. Chapter 13, verse 15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. We practice the presence of God when we worship him in spirit and truth. I love to worship. I love getting together in corporate worship. I love when we're together here. And I, a lot of times I just kind of scan the room because I love to see other people worshiping. There's just something about when we come together. But this is worship that's of a different kind. This is, we're talking about the, the personal practice of the presence of God. The private practice and privately worshiping. I don't know if you worship on your own. Listen, worship isn't something that's just dedicated to this room when we gather together like this. Worship is part of our life. I'm not saying you gotta like get some soundtracks and, and sing, sing songs to people. I'm saying in your own time, do you, do you have time every day of worship and how you live your life? You can view that as worship. That's what it is. I'm doing with my life what God created me to do. That's worship to him. I'm living by a standard of holiness and letting the presence of God shine through. That's worship to him. We're worshiping him. The reality is when we live a life of worship on our own, day to day, and we gather together like this, if we've been worshiping all week and we gather together, imagine how much more intense and special our worship is gonna be. And I'm guilty many times of coming in and just showing up, and there's been all kinds of things going on, and I am not here. Maybe my week has not been living in the presence of God like I should. But when we do that, if we all make that effort and come together, it is amazing. Reverence for God and awe and respect. Moses had an awe and respect for God like none other. Deuteronomy describes him as one whom the Lord knew face to face, and that's a big deal. In Exodus 33, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. In Numbers, it says that Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. Moses revered God. He revered him as infinitely greater than himself, and he never took for granted the honor of being in God's presence. How about us? Do we recognize and revere God's presence, or is it just common and ordinary? Do we value his presence? Do we realize that he's with us? He's made himself available to us to help us to do what he wants us to do. The fourth thing is this, follow. Go back to Exodus chapter 40 and it tells about the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. And it was a cloud by day and a fire by night and that guided them throughout their 40 year journey. 
And it was a sign of his, of his presence with them. And wherever that cloud would go, they would follow. You see, following the Lord is similar to obeying, but it's very, very different. When we obey his commands, we, li- we, we, we live in ways that please him. When we obey his commands, we live in ways that please him. But when we follow his guidance, we go where he wants to take us in life. He is our shepherd, the one who leads us in paths of righteousness, as the psalmist says. There's a lot of things that you could fill your life with. As a believer, you are full of the presence of God. Let him fill your life because all the things that we'll try to fill those spaces in our life with are only substitutes that will never be enough. Only Jesus is enough. And he said, surely I'm with you to the very end. There's no strings attached to his promise of his presence. He simply says, wherever you go, whatever you do, I'll be with you. It's, it's amazing to know that God is with us. But God also created you to be with him. He created you to be with him. Maybe you found this to be true. You can be in the presence of someone else. You can be with that person in the flesh. And it's entirely possible that you're in the room with that other person in the flesh, face to face, and you realize you're there, but they're not. How many of you know what I'm talking about? A lot of wives putting their hands up. God created us to be with him. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. He created us to be with him. So my question, my challenge to you today is how do you practically be with Jesus? How do you practically engage his presence? I want to just challenge you today in practicing the presence of God to have a day with Jesus. And I'd like to ask us as a church to start this this week and specifically tomorrow. Monday's a great day. But I wanna ask you to pick up this challenge to tomorrow, Monday, January the 24th, to make it a day with Jesus. And you say, well, he's with us always, so it's a day with him. Uh, Not really, because we're often in the room with him. He's there, he's present, but we're not. Just for example, when your alarm clock goes off in the morning, what kind of attitude do you have? I can imagine a lot of arms just reaching over and slamming the snooze button with a grunt or a groan or something like that. Maybe even something that you wouldn't want us to hear what you say. The reality is, is when you wake up tomorrow morning, it is a day with Jesus. And it's not something new. He's been with you. You're just acknowledging you're with me today. God, thank you that as my eyes open today, I have another day to live for you. I don't know how many days I have left, but here's another one, and I give this day to you. Start it with him. In the shower, as you're getting clothes on, I mean, just remind yourself of the truths of God. When you're putting your clothes on, put on on the armor of God. You button your shirts, the breastplate of righteousness, and, and just remind yourself of what he's done and how he's empowered you and how he's gifted you. As you drive in your car to work, a lot of us are driving. You're driving today. None of you are walking, I'm sure. When you get behind the wheel, like conscious effort, God, you're with me. And here's the reality is that I often take the wheel in my own life, and, and I want to give you control. I want you to steer and guide my life. Would you do that? How many of you would say, I'm going to take that challenge? I'm not asking for perfection. I'm asking you to pick up the challenge and say, I want to practice the presence of God. We get in self, like, self-control like self mode and we're doing our own thing. Honestly, you know, God might be part of our life, but have we given him all of our life? God might be part of our time in the day, but we, have we given him all of our day? You see what I'm saying? It's not like we're just, we're engaging with God. How many of you will do that? Why don't you stand with me? I've gone over, I apologize. Didn't think I had much to say, but evidently too much.
Guys, if we're gonna see a move of God, we've got to be submitted, we've got to be surrendered, we've got to let his presence live in our life. We've got to have him with us. As Moses said, God, don't ask us to go anywhere if you're not gonna go with us. That should be our, that should be our motto. I'll go wherever God goes, that's where I'm going. Wherever I go, I want him to go with me or I'm not going. Let's engage. The Bible says that they that wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. We need the Lord. We need his presence. We need the fullness of his presence in our lives. And I'm challenging you today, tomorrow, Start your day with Jesus and in everything you do. There's all kinds of run-ins, bump-ins with people, unexpected things. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. There's something maybe He wants you to say, some encouraging word, some way to help. Be engaged. Let His Spirit be full in you. You're going to find that when you fill yourself and allow His Spirit, presence to to just kind of pour out of you it's going to attract people to you if next Sunday we all spend every day this week because I, I challenge you to tomorrow but the idea is that the next day is a new day let's let's start all over again because it's the same day not just one day a week it's not just a Sunday morning service this is our life and he's given us himself to help us do this if we all spend every day this week practicing his presence can you imagine what next Sunday service is going to be like and I can only imagine that if somebody shows up and they don't have a relationship with Jesus they're going to walk in here and go what is the world is this whatever it is I want and I won't, there won't be an altar call they'll just come and say how do I how do I tell us I mean on the day of Pentecost they were saying to Peter tell us what we need to do he didn't even give them an option. They just said, tell us, what's, what's our next step? How do we do this? That's what I desire, a move of God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? If there's someone in the room and you're going today, I, Pastor Jeff, I have no relationship with God. I don't know what this is all about. But I, I want the peace that comes from knowing that my life is taken care of in my sin and the joy that comes in living this life like I see other people living and I want that. If that's you this morning with every eye closed in the place, but that's you, you would just raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeff, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. And you'll raise your hand. Just look up, look at me. Raise your hand and keep your hand raised. The greatest decision you can ever make. Today, if you're watching online and you are receiving that today and you want to make that decision, just follow this prayer with me. Lord, we, we want you. We were created by you, designed by you, with a place in our life for you to live. And so we welcome you and invite you into, the, into, into our life. Be Lord, forgive us of our sins. Help us in this journey of faith and walking toward you and walking with you. Lord, for, take our sin, remove our sin. Give us the hope of not only life with Jesus here on earth, but eternal life in heaven. We receive all that you have for us. Be our Lord, be our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, live the presence. Practice the presence. Be aware of his presence. Only you. We can't do it for you. If I challenge you, live in his presence every day this week. God bless you. Tonight, Pastor Weaver is going to be sharing... And I believe that there's going to be some um, amazing things that happen tonight if we come expecting and ready. So t practice this stuff today and be back this evening. And we're going to see what God will do. Amen.